Okay, yeah. Um, firstly, thank you all for for making this. I know how precious all of your your times are, so I'm always grateful when people make the the time for this. As, as Neil said, my name is Martin. I'm one of the managing partners at Garden. We're a we're a consultancy uh, that works predominantly with scale ups, and we help them tell their stories, uh, go to market, and of course, hopefully, win win more business. As Neil says, background is uh, you could tie up the titles however you like, but they've always been in sales. Um, previously, Microsoft, looking after brands like Telefonica, so O2 more familiarly known here, uh, and uh, at Twitter, looking after brands like Adidas through the World Cup and through the Olympics. Um, and now, yeah, one of the managing partners at Garden, helping uh, scale-ups sell more. So. I'm going to talk to you about three things, just three principles today, and these are the these are the three principles that that we see most startups and scale ups, I think, get wrong or, or, or can have some uh, uh, work done in in refining them. And I'm going to jump straight straight into them. And the 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 first of these the first of these three things is first contact. A first contact is arguably the most important moment in the entire of the sales process. I mean, if you get your first contact right and you make that connection right, then in theory, that has a knock on the effect for the entire of your, your pipeline. And, and as we all know better now in the last 12 months, better than any anything else, is that most of those first contacts with a new customer whether that's through an introduction, through another contact, or just a cold outreach, is happening now on LinkedIn or, or, or through email, very rarely in the, the, the traditional formats that we're used to. In fact, the sales process now probably looks something like this. You reach out to them on LinkedIn, you get their email address, you send them an email, you send them your one page of summary, uh, you then send them an e another email to catch up with them. Hopefully, you get to actually talk to that person. In the old world, you would have gone for a coffee with them. You then send them the one pager because they've probably lost it. You then meet with their team. You then present to their team. You resend them the one pager because they lost it. Uh, you then speak to them on email again. And then if you're lucky, you'll go for another coffee. And if you're really lucky, you'll get a contract at the end of it. And as we, as we all know, you tend to go around in circles by here, and you'll go around in circles by here. If you're really lucky, you'll go from here right through to the end. It, it really is like a game of snakes and ladders. Um, you know, you can, there are shortcuts there, but there are also many pitfalls that you'll go back on as well. But what I've never seen, what I've absolutely never seen is it go from here to here in one go? It just doesn't happen. Of course it doesn't. And this is what first contact, the first principle of first contact is all about. The objective should be, how do you get a yes through to the next step? You shouldn't be trying to sell and close a sale within those first 15 minutes of contact. And the mistake that we see the, uh, many people make is trying to pile so much information onto people and try to give them everything they need in those first 15 minutes to say yes to a sale. But really the objective should be, how do you get a yes to the next step? So what do I mean by this? Well, let's talk through a, a practical example. So this is an example from about four months ago uh, for one of our clients that we were just helping out with a little bit of outreach. They were a bit of advertising tech that do targeting without any personal information. Very interesting, but you, there's no need to know the details beyond that. So what we did was, first of all, we went on LinkedIn. This was a new um, area of contacts for us, so we wanted to find some new contacts. First, we went on LinkedIn. We then looked for people who had jobs in the targeting ad space. Then we looked for people with the job titles of innovation or head of me, head of targeting or something like that. And then we looked for those individuals. And then we started reaching out to, to those guys. And just to be clear, all the names and contact details and everything have all been changed. That's actually one of our other managing partners rather than a client there. That's Volker. Um, but we're going to use him in this, in this example. 
So that first contact LinkedIn message or that first contact email, however it is you're reaching out to them, we sent out a, a, a request and then sent this message to them as well. Hi, Volker. Hope you're well. I work at a consultancy that helps launch tech scale-ups in new markets. There's one piece of tech, that's not the name that's not important, on our roster that may be of interest. What's your email? Could I send you a one-pager? Really simple, actually quite light on detail there. And what we've done there, we've made one request. We've made it extremely simple for that person. And we've just made it a yes or no. We've made a really simple yes or no, minimum effort from them. And it, it's really important that you make simple questions uh, shaped like that yes or no, particularly in the early stage. People don't like saying no. People are more likely to ignore you than say no to you at this stage. So by providing yes or no answers, they either say yes, or they give you an opportunity to contact them again uh, in the future. And that went well. Volker got back to us. Hi, Martin. Sounds interesting. I'm on supervolker at volker.volker. Great email address. And again, we then on email reach out to him, attaching the one pager. Hi, Volker. We're just about to launch the tech in the UK. It's a pretty unique technical approach, and they already have some brilliant results from IKEA. Do you have 15 minutes for a call at 2.30 on the 8th of February? 15 minutes is really important. There's absolutely no reason why you would need an hour to speak to someone. You know, arguably, you don't even need half an hour. Again, make it really simple for them. And here, we've provided a little bit of a teaser, an introduction. Again, we have not gone into heavy detail at all. You know, the one pager that we're attaching, that's going to do that job for us in a very concise way. Um, we've made one request again, and we've made it simple. Is it a yes or no? Uh, can they say yes to that? And it's a short amount of time, making it as simple as possible. And it's fantastic. Volker's got back to us. That's exactly what we wanted. And he gets back to us with blah, 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 a million questions, thrown us off in a thousand different directions. He's completely misunderstood one part of it. He's really pinning us down on this one piece. This is so important. Don't get pulled in on email. Do not get pulled in on email. It will turn into you sending essays back and forth to each other, um, contradicting each other and, and using up an awful lot of time of both your times. Remember, the objective here is to get Volker on a telephone call. That is all we're trying to do. So how do we reply? Hi, Volker. Yes, that's really interesting. Big area of development in the industry. Do you have 15 minutes for a call? And we just follow back with that. And do you know what? If he doesn't have 15 minutes for a call, he probably shouldn't be at the top of your list uh, uh, for pushing to, to, to try and close business with him. You know, you need to find those, those, those easier contacts in those early days. But fortunately, from here then, we had the call and, and, it, and it went on and we got him on that phone call. So the key thing with this one is all about, it's not closing in that first instance. It's about what do you need to do to get to that next step? Getting a yes through to the next step. Cool, okay. So that's number one. Now, task one, and this is a really simple exercise, but it really helps you formulate the way that you're approaching your clients. And it's about understanding and tracking your objectives. So the first task is to list out what those objectives are for each of your clients. What are the stages at, at which you think um, you're moving that sale forward? Um, and effectively, what you're building here is your, your sales pipeline. I've seen so many pipelines uh, being built with um, arbitrary figures of 50, 75, 90% and so on, which are very conceptual and don't have any real meaning. And they quite often wonder why their sales teams don't fill them out. But putting realistic and specific um, objectives uh, and each step in there is really helpful to give a clear direction uh, of the next steps you need to close, close that business. Cool. Okay, so that's number one. The second one 
is your basic narrative, your sales narrative. Now, on the face of it, this is probably the simplest one out of the three, um, but I can safely say this is the most difficult one to get right and to get this concise. Uh, does anyone know this man? And I, there might be some boos or cheers, depending on who you are, um, seeing this, this man. Well, this is uh, Alistair Campbell. He's a spin doctor or comms director for, for New Labour in the, the Tony Blair years. Um, very good comms man, great, great strategist, uh, whether you like the guy or not. Uh, there's a slightly nice, nicer picture of him. Now, he wrote a, a brilliant book called, called Winners. And he talks about three words in that book being the most important words in the English language. And those words are objective, strategy and tactics. Objective, strategy and tactics. Words we're all, we're all familiar with. And in the context that, that Campbell was using them, objective is the big what. You know, what will we achieve? The strategy is the big how. How are you approaching it? And then the tactics, and the tactics are the practical actions that you take. Now, a bit of a heads up, your product or service is almost certainly a tactic. It almost definitely isn't a strategy, and it absolutely is not the objective itself. But we'll come on to that in a, in a bit more detail uh, more shortly. So how, how do we apply this? Well, here's a few examples. Let's look at Apple when Steve Jobs first returned to Apple. The objective wasn't to become a billion dollar business, it was to survive. And their strategy was simplify. And then the tactics were simplify the products, simplify the culture, simplify the communication, simplify. If you look at us, Garden, our objective is to help people sell. The strategy is through storytelling. And then the tactics is storytelling by helping people build narratives, run storytelling workshops, building sales material based around storytelling. If you look at New Labour, when Alistair Campbell was there, the objective was, of course, win an election. The strategy was modernise. And then the tactics were all aligned to that. Modernise the NHS, modernise taxes, modernise society. I mean, even if you didn't know what New Labour's policy was on taxes, you knew it was to modernise it. I mean, they were called New Labour. It was all aligned, a very simple, clear narrative that was easy to sell. Objective, strategy and tactics. Objective, strategy and tactics. So the thing that we see people do most often in startups and scale-ups is jump straight to here and just talk about the tactic itself. And particularly if you're meeting someone for the first time, by jumping straight into your product without any context at all, can really confuse that individual and make the people that you're talking to work really hard. So let's have a look how we can build the objective and strategy uh, to align to that, those, those tactics. So a bit of a test on this one. This is my resolution and, and show you why it's so important not to start with the tactics. Now, in this example from my resolution last year, well, about eight or nine months ago, if I told you that the tactic was to not eat beef, can anyone take a guess at what the strategy is? And think in your own head or put it in the messages if you want to, but have a think what the strategy is. So the strategy was to cut down on greenhouse gases. Now, if that was my strategy, can anyone take a guess at what the objective was? Well, the, the objective was actually to make me feel less guilty about driving my diesel car for a couple more years. You see, the most important thing here is not to assume what the strategy or what the objective is. And actually, even within teams, within startups and scale-ups, um, whenever we run workshops looking at these three words, by the time we get on to strategy, we quite have to often have people shouting across the room at each other because they all think that they have a slightly different version of what the strategy is. But this is really important when you're providing your narrative at that first meeting in those first 15 minutes, don't leave people guessing what your objective and strategy is. Be clear of that first and give the context for your tactics, which is most likely gonna be your product 
or your service. Okay, we're going to do one more, one more um, uh, 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 test or example, should we, should we say, all about my next holiday. So is my next holiday an objective, a strategy, or a tactic? An objective, a strategy, or a tactic? And I mean, this is something that's so personal to us. And actually, it can be quite difficult to figure out whether that holiday is a tactic, a strategy, or an objective in itself. And I mean, if we find it hard for doing something that's so personal for us, imagine how it is for a, for a business or someone else working at your business. So I would argue that my next holiday is a, a tactic. I'd say the strategy was something like escapism. And then the objective was something like to de-stress. How's everyone's holiday planning going at the moment? We need to adapt, don't we? Pivot, that's it. Pivot's the word that everyone seems to be using at the moment. So my other half's getting really into gardening, but the strategy is the same and the overarching objective is the same. I'm cycling a lot more. I've heard knitting is up about 40% year on year at the moment with, uh, with everything that's happening. And this is a really important point because having a clear strategy helps you adapt your narrative in the future. And particularly at moments like this, it can actually help your business strategy as well. Because if you can be clear about what your overarching objective and strategy is, then you can be much clearer and, 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 and much better at communicating uh, any products that you, that you pivot to. So where's this all going? Objective, strategy, and tactic. Let's go back to gardens one. So the objective is sell, the strategy is storytelling, and, and those three are the tactics. And from this, we can start building our basic narrative. So the basic narrative for garden is we help businesses sell more through storytelling. That's it. That's it. And then the tactics, we help you design your narrative, refine your positioning, and support you going to market. In one sentence there, we've effectively got our objective and strategy. And in the second sentence there, we've got all three of our tactics, objective, strategy, and tactics. A really simple model to be clear about what you're communicating. Okay, number task number two then. Uh, and this, take your time over this one. I, I, I'd implore you, this one is a, is a really difficult one. But firstly, is to build out what you think those objective strategy and tactics are. And again, a heads up, your product or service is probably a tactic. And then try just using this simple formula here. We help you objective through strategy. We do this by tactic one, tactic two, and tactic three. Now, you might need to change the language slightly to make it fit in with exactly what your objective strategy and tactics are. But it really should be this simple to get that first step in the, in the door. And remember, when we look back at the objective being a yes to the next step, you're not trying to convince someone to buy your product at this stage. You're trying to convince them to stay listening, to keep their attention with you so you can continue talking to them. So there we go, that's, that's number two. So your basic narrative, objective, strategy and tactics. Great, well that's the first two. And the third one feels extremely simple. I guess it's really simple to get out and, and testing it. And the third one is simply this. Does that make sense? That question. And actually quite specifically that question as well. Uh, that, the, the phrasing of that question actually does have a big, a big impact. Like firstly, of course, from a feedback perspective, we all know we need to ask for feedback and, and, and get more feedback. Um, but actually, probably even more importantly than that is that when you ask that question, the response that people will give is not only telling you what they understood, but telling you what's important to them as well. So it allows you to focus the conversation. And once they've replied to that question, you can start focusing in and continuing the conversation. The third reason it's so, so important is a bit of a cheeky one at conferences and, and so on. But I'm sure we've all been in that situation where we all introduce ourselves. 
And unless you're the last person in that small group, say of three or four people to introduce yourself, then you introduce yourself and that's the end of it. But actually, if you ask this question at the end of that introduction, it encourages people to start asking you questions and continues that conversation and moves it forward. So after you've done your um, uh, basic narrative as an introduction, then follow up with that question. Does that make sense? And you get feedback, uh, focus on what to talk about next, and you can move the conversation forward. Okay, so that brings us to, to task three, and I'll, I'll send these over to you. And that's keep track of your most common questions. And, and this is really important for a couple of reasons, and potentially the second reason even more so. But the first one is that you can start figuring out, do you want to preempt these questions in your narrative? Like, do you want to stop these questions from happening? But then you'll also find some questions are really useful for gaining people's uh, attention and kind of introducing teasers for people to ask them, ask you more. Like, are there ways of forcing questions that you know are useful to you? So you can actually make them ask those questions as uh, uh, to allow you to progress your narrative. Cool. And that, and that everyone is, is just about it. So the first one, first contact, think about how you can get a yes to the next step. You don't need to be closing every moment. The second one, think about your basic narrative. Uh, this is absolutely the most difficult one, but using that objective strategy and tactics structure to start building a simple narrative that can be quickly understood and use that question. Does that make sense? Gives feedback, allows you to focus where it goes and allows you to control the conversation and allow it to go forward. And that's that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Martin. That was uh, incredibly uh, useful. I know certainly that uh, from a personal point of view, I'm always useless in sales conversations. Uh, historically, it's not been a strong point for me. Uh, and I look back, you know, after chatting to you and, and watching this presentation, I look back in the many, many, you know, sales conversations I've had over the years where I've got, got in the room with the people or, I, you know, I'm having the coffee or I'm having the meeting and yeah. I've had no focus. Uh, and you, I'm just happy that they're still talking to me. Every time the, the clock uh, hand hits the hits the top, and they've been talking to me for another 60 seconds. I must be closer to a sale, right? And it's, of course, that's just not how it works. But no, this has been incredibly useful to, to get a, a, a full understanding of just how to go into that with just a little bit more thought and care, which is not something uh, I've done uh, particularly well in the past. And it's it's difficult. It's difficult, like particularly that 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 second one with the example of not getting pulled in, where you get a hundred questions sent to you. Your instinct is, I need to prove this person completely wrong. I need to answer every one of those those individual questions. But from experience, that never that never works. Hundred you know, percent. Yeah. I, I, but I still get pulled into that. I'll do that yeah. every now and then. I think I mean, it's difficult not to, you know, it's, it's even, on, even on a human level, right? It's like we, we, we do engage in conversation. By the way, folks, uh, put your questions in the chat. I'll, uh, I'll ask um, Martin um, some chats. Oh, there we go. We've already, already got a question. Um, I have a direct message here. It's interested on, uh, in your view on how the method of achieving a sale has changed in the past five to 10 years. And obviously it's changed a lot in the last... 12 months there's no doubt about that um, and actually what's interesting for me is that um, certainly in a lot of the world that I work in which uh, is startup funding and various bits and pieces that hasn't seemed to have slowed a lot and there's, I'm now seeing lots and lots of v VCs and investment uh, houses doing deals with never having met their, their the people they're investing in before which would almost certainly never have happened mm. uh, 12 months ago. But I think Andrew's question here is more about, you know, the last five to 10 years, what, what does that look like? I think it's, uh, what's the land, how's that landscape change? Well, it's, I, I would say it's the last fight, like I'm 2007 or the knock on effects, like in 2009, that's probably the biggest shift that I've experienced. And I think that the, the difference 
uh, with that one there was the amount of money that just absolutely got sucked out of, you know, and that was my first recession, but the amount mm. of money that got sucked out of industry at that point. And that actually had effects with, I would say, within sales that, that haven't changed, changed back. I think people are a lot more interested in, in looking at the, the bottom number. There's less money you know, just thrown around um, freely and digital sort of became serious at, at that point as well. Well, I think the, the big thing for now, like over the last couple of, well, over the last 12 months, I'd say the, the big thing, and it's the same when it was in, in 2007, is that startups and scale-ups, this is absolutely the, the golden time for you. I mean, if you look at big companies with contracts with the big established companies, you know, right now they're looking at those contracts and figuring out how can they save money. And one of the best ways of saving money is, is going with a new player. Um, and, and particularly when, you know, if you can offer something that is perhaps slightly narrower, um, but of a, a higher quality or cheaper or faster. Those are the three things, by the way, faster, cheaper yeah. or, or, or better. There's, there's nothing else anyone offers. If you can do one of those, if you can do something better than those larger established companies now is a amazing time for startups and, and scale-ups. I feel like I went into just my own point there rather than- No, no, I, th I think it's, it's, it's it, you know, and I, c I can see that, you know, certainly I think the days of sending uh, men out on the road with cheap suits by the hundreds to do the selling is kind of gone, you know, and that's, that's certainly even before COVID that was true, you know, just sending lots and lots of people out on the road to do that kind of selling. Um, and yeah, and, and Andrew's kind of pointed out in the, in the chat sort of the, the, the importance of an integrated approach between marketing and sales, you know, it's like, you can't just do your marketing and then let your salespeople go and do that job. It's, you know, you, you, it has to be, a, and that's where the OST thing comes in. I mean, what's interesting is you can't see, but I have a lot of uh, post-it notes to my left here and following a, a talk of Martin's I attended probably about a year ago. There's one here, which hi, because of green screen, you can't even see it. Basically this post-it says, um, objective strategy tactics, objective being the big what, strategy, the big how, and tactics is the doing um, and how you define that single story to align them all. And I have that as a post-it note as a reminder for me here. And I, it's, um, it's become incredibly important for me and how I think about my business, how I talk about my business and, and yeah, aligning marketing and sales. So that they're all singing from the same hymn sheet is, is increasingly important. Yeah. Like we, we often get brought in, like our entry point with our clients is, is usually on the narrative piece. But the reason people keep working with us is because then, yeah, that messaging goes into marketing. It also goes into business strategy. It also goes into product development as well. Because particularly once you've got that objective and strategy very precise, then you can start saying no quite often <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to, to certain things that you're looking at developing. Um, but sure. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, a question here from uh, Roger, which I think is very interesting, also very relevant, and it's something I've uh, been become aware of uh, through my own sort of cold outreach campaigns and whatever. Is so the biggest problem is making initial contact. So LinkedIn's useful because obviously you have that targeting, uh, but the response rate is less than ten percent. So what level of re response is reasonable to expect? And and that again is a bit of a piece. How long's a piece of string uh, thing? And I have my own thoughts on it. But yeah, go, tell me what you um, what you would yeah say to well, that. Yeah. Well, well, first thing is get thick skin um, <laughs> because yeah, re rejection and it's 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 really hard. You know, I, I you know we we're we're very hands on. We're we're you know we do some of the reaching out for people, and you need thick skin. It's really hard. Um, and, you know, the length of piece of string question is, yeah, well, it could be anything between, I, I've had responses around 10% up to 90%, but then it's all dependent on how simple that product is to understand, how targeted your audience is, 
and, and all, all of those kind of things. There's there's a couple of suggestions I can I would make though. Um, the first one is that if you are reaching out to hundreds of people, then don't reach out to hundreds of people in one go. Um, maybe reach out to five of them and don't reach out to the ones that you think are most likely to reply as well. Because I, I, I guarantee as soon as you get a message back, you'll change that, that first message that you send out. So just send out five or so, first of all, get some feedback off of them, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and if you're speaking to them, you know, use it as a chance to get feedback off of them, you know, ask them what, in, don't just sell at them, you know, but does it make sense? Piece is important, you know, using that sort of questioning, but use it to refine uh, what you're sending out to people. Um, but yeah, it's hard to know if 10% is, is good or bad. It, it can be such, such a range, but it's just make sure yeah. that you refine it and simplify it as much as you can. And yeah, the reality is, is get used to get used to rejection because that, that that happens a lot. A, a ten percent on a on a big cold outreach campaign hey. is actually a ten percent response is is pretty good. You know, it's like it depends on how targeted you are and whatever. And, and the the broader you go with your targeting, or the the more mass mail you go, inevitably your response rates are going to drop. It's just the the sort of law of these things, um, and. It's we uh, we ran a massive cold email campaign a couple of years ago that, that sort of won a lot of attention for its sort of innovation. It was a picture of me uh, and through a little bit of tech, we were able to um, put their company logo on a, on um, on my T-shirt. So the the email was, um, hey, I'm wearing, you know, a garden T-shirt or a, um, who else, you know, an AGP T-shirt or a, a Camtronics Vale Limited T-shirt. And it actually, you know, and that was all automated and that was done at huge scale. And uh, it got a lot of attention because it was very, every single email was targeted, but we were sending tens of thousands of emails. Um, but we the sales were very not sporadic but sometimes we'd send a, a bunch out and they would be we'd get incredible sales and sometimes we'd get almost nothing and it very much depended on um who we were targeting what sector like for some reason bike manufacturers seem to buy huge amounts from us uh we were in the we are in the business of selling promotional merchandise um so yeah it's 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 very much a, a case of how how targeted you go and yeah like you say we we started really really slowly we started with just a handful of emails just get feedback and, and ask why people responded to them don't be afraid to use personality and humor uh, don't be afraid to to show a bit of yourself be a bit transparent and you know i generally tend to reply i mean i get multiple messages a day on linkedin and i ignore them almost exclusively partly because they're not relevant to me, but partly because I can tell that I'm the 500th person who's received that message today. So if you can do just a little bit, like you were saying, uh, to personalize that uh, up front. Before I forget, the link to book a 15 minute session with Martin is now in the chat. Um, what else do we have? Are there any further questions? Um, question from Mel. I've been told the book Competitive Strategy by Michael Porter should be used, but it's several generations old. Is that perhaps overcomplicating things? Uh, I don't know that book to you. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard. I, I haven't read it, hands up, but I do I do know that book and it, it, it quite often gets referenced. Um, so I, I, could, I, could, I could talk to, for hours in this sort of area. Nothing's really changed in selling in 50, 60 years, I, I would say. You know, I, I don't think the fact that we're digital and online, I, the, the principles haven't changed, even if the medium that we we send it in in has, um, which you could argue so many things around what I just said. Um, but it probably is going a bit deep to, to, as a starting point. Um, uh, but the principles within books like that are, are, are greatly valid, even if these specific examples exa examples aren't. Um, uh, uh, but there's there's books like um, uh, Blitz Scaling and, and so on, which I think actually things like that give much better insight into um, like sales strategy and strategy approach and 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 and, and that type of 
uh, type of thing in a fast paced environment. Um, so there are other things out there. Um, but yeah, it, it, apparently it's a very good book, but I haven't, I haven't read that one myself. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to, my gut feeling is a lot of the old business books that are still, you know, they're, they're still relevant stuff, but there are people who are using that knowledge and condensing it and distilling it into yeah. more modern, shorter, more easy to, con- you know, because the, the, old, the old thing with books was like, write 50,000 words because it looks like it's worth it it has value but actually you can probably communicate most which is why these sessions are half an hour right it's like you don't need an hour to communicate value sometimes and same with books I think business books are getting smaller hopefully because uh, you can get that value across in shorter amounts um so last couple of things then Uh, Sam has asked if she could send you a LinkedIn connection um I'm sure that's absolutely fine Carmel has asked what type of businesses you work with so um To add to that, if you could say a little bit about that, but also add to that about the type of businesses that you think where there's where there's the low hanging fruit, what type of businesses do you think Mm. aren't doing this stuff right? Like who are the businesses that really because obviously there's certain types of businesses who are great at this. And there's other types of businesses who are just not very good. You know, what what does, you know, so tell us about the businesses you work with and, and which ones are good and which are bad, not naming names, but I just mean, you know, sectors. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, really, it's, it's across all sectors. I think the, the, the key things, is our clients generally fall into two buckets. The one bucket is a, is a real scaling business. And I, I don't mean scaling by specific revenue numbers, but they've probably gone from either just the CEO selling to suddenly having five salespeople or they're going from two or three salespeople up to 10 salespeople. Um, they've, quite often they've had investment or they're looking at growth. And whereas they've been growing really well and quickly up till now, when they start expanding, it doesn't quite go up how they were hoping for. And, and the reason that's happening is quite often they're going from selling to customers who have what we would call very lean forward, very engaged customers that are ready to ask questions and poke around a bit to customers that are a lot more lean back and aren't expecting their, their, their calls. And we work really well with those type of companies because we're able to take what they're already taken out to market and refine it and make it a lot clearer. And, you know, particularly around that concept of the first 15 minutes, make sure that all of that information that they're providing is getting them closer to a sale and moving them in the right direction. And actually, sometimes these businesses just need somebody external. I mean, if you do that objective strategy and tactics thing yourself, get anyone external to do it. In fact, ask someone that's familiar with your business, but not inside it to do the same same task and see what they come out with because it's sometimes surprising, yeah. but always get someone external to look at it because it, it becomes impossible for you to do that internally. Like actually we, we try and like when we work with new clients, we try to stay as external as we can for as long as we can. We don't want to see any internal strategy documents because we try to stay as external as we can. To, what just gives you that objectivity and you don't get snow blind to the... 100%. 100%. Yeah. The longer we can stay external, the better we are. So scaling business is probably about 60% of our business. Um, and then maybe a bit more than that. And then the, the rest of it is um, large startup. You know, someone who knows they've got something good, they've managed to get their first five, 10 set sales, you know, and things are going in the right direction. But they're, they're just not managing to scale it at all from that. And actually, we quite find with those type of clients, their first five sales are the easiest ones. It's the next thousand that's really difficult. And again, refining their messaging and their approach um, is where we help there. Broadly as well, it's B2B. Um, mm-hmm. so it's, and, and selling to organizations is broadly where we, we've got some B2C clients. But in fact, even the B2C clients, they're selling into selfridges or they're selling into supermarkets or something right. like so that. they have channel partners that they're really yeah. that's their real it's b2b to c or yeah exactly yeah 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 i, I think i babbled on as per usual okay. there, but and com- idea. 
No, 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 it's fine. And so, and, and just, just quickly, that sort of point around, you know, the types of businesses that do this stuff well and the types of businesses that don't do this stuff well, are there any kind of, or maybe that maybe it's not that clear? I, 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 I don't think it's, I don't think it's that clear because there's, there's quite often a, someone within their market that is doing it, doing it well. I, I think the businesses that we find are the closest on the right tracks, the, the, the people who are selling one thing or are selling one thing new and solving a very, very specific problem. Um, that makes it very, very uh, much more, e much easier to do. The problem comes is with the scaling businesses, they're wanting to do more things and expand um, several parts of their team at the, at the same time, uh, which is great, which is amazing ambition, but that's, mm -hmm. it's those fast scaling ones that have the biggest difficulties, but there's not industries or anything. There's somebody doing it badly and well in, in all of these markets. Yeah, it's this the thing that sort of there's um there's a really good mantra and I don't know who 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 came up with it, but it was like and it's one thing I sort of talk about with mentees and is um one problem, one revenue stream, uh, and one customer, or you know one one problem, one customer, one revenue stream, and you know you look at you know Amazon does pretty much everything now, but when it started, it sold books to a particular type of person. And then it's, you know, it's, it's expanded, but it, it took a very long time. I think it was selling books just for the best part of five years before it even thought about anything else. Uber, Uber was a, uh, an app for millennials in metropolitan areas. Um, and it didn't change from that until, you know, you know, and it's only now really that aunties and grannies might even consider using it. Um, so yeah, it's it's I, I think having that focus and the scale and then diversifying your products is where it gets really, um, really really tricky. And I can imagine then unifying the objective and the strategy and the tactics when you've got a big portfolio of products becomes uh, increasingly difficult. Right. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, let's have a look. No more questions. Um, Great, fantastic. Thank you, folks. Um, if, uh, I think we'll send the slides around. Uh, Martin, if you can stick around on the call just for two minutes sure. at the end. Um, there's some thanks and stuff in the chat. But otherwise, uh, thanks for attending, everyone. And hopefully, uh, yeah, if you're not already on the mailing list, um, drop me an email, put your email address in the chat, um, and we'll make sure you're, you're um, kept up to date with future events. Um, thanks, folks. Great. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for your time. Bye.